Welcome to Cheap Controls. We make videos on things that we struggled with, hoping to help you so you don't. Consider subscribing and hitting that bell. In this one I'm going to show how to use the pulse width modulation directly out of the Nexion to control an LED and possibly a servo. We'll see how it goes. I'm also going to go over some of the other inputs and outputs that you can use in the Nexion if you want to use it just directly without using an Arduino or anything else. The configuration in the Nexion uses something called the CFPGIO pin but it's, it's pretty much input and output forms and you can program them to be inputs or outputs. It's only on the enhanced and the intelligent. This video isn't compatible with the basic version. It's only on the enhanced and only on the intelligent. What's strange is the enhanced has more pulse width modulated outputs than the intelligent one. I'm not sure why that is but that's just kind of the way it is. There's four pulse width modulated outputs on the enhanced and only two on the intelligent. We're going to use the enhanced for today. There are three things you need to configure. The pin itself, the mode, and in one case you can bind that pin to a component on the display. The pin is fairly self-explanatory. You've got pin 0 through 7. It is zero base. You have a total of eight pins, but they're numbered 0 through 7. And then the mode we get into down here. You have five different modes. A pull-up input, you can bind the input, you've got a push-pull output, a pulse width modulated output, and an open drain output. And we're going to go through each one of these. The only time you use the component is in mode 1, and you use the object or the ID that you're binding it to. And it's only on an input, not an output. So let's just say that you're, you have a, a something out there, a switch in the real world, and you want to bind it to a switch on the next one. So whenever you push the physical switch, it looks like you're pushing the one on the display, and that's what that's for. I'm going to build out the Nexion display as I go through this uh, video. It's recommended that you initialize the CF GPIO pins in the post initialization of the page itself. So when you click on the page, it brings up these tabs over here. And we're going to click the post initialization one. And we're going to start by configuring pin 0. And we're going to pick the first mode in here, which is also a zero, which is a pull-up input mode. And since we're not using mode one, you just make that third one zero. We're going to need two features on the on the Nexion itself to utilize this. We're going to add a number and a timer. You could also do this with a button so you would show it, but I'm going to show it in a number field. And so this timer is set to go every 400 milliseconds. We're just going to leave it to the default. And what we want it to do is we want it to write into this number value the value that PIO, well in this case I don't know why I put 4 in there, PIO 0 is, what the input number 0 is. We have it configured as an input and we want to write the value that it's currently set at in this number field. This may not make a lot of sense, but when I run it in, when I upload it to the display, hopefully it will. I have this set up as best I can. I'm not sure how clear it's going to be, but you can see the number field over here on the display. And then here's my board. This is just something I got that attaches through a ribbon cable and connects this board and the different output pins to the Nexion. It makes it easier to use. It has I'm going to pull these wires off. It has a header panel down here so you can connect directly into it and we're going to use that to run this LED up here. But it also has buttons that you can push to simulate some things too. Down here is my, is my zero. This is connected to pin zero. It's also connected over here to pin zero. And then we have it tied in software to here. So when the timer sees this change, it should change over here. And you can see that it went to zero. The reason I put the number field in too is I want to show that the that the resting state is high or five volts. That's something I didn't expect when I got it. I thought that everything would be tied low and then as you utilized it, it would go high. Okay, I've connected the pins back up down here. 
So I can show you how to manually set it up. Now on this header pin you have a ground and a, and a plus 5 voltage. So I've got the plus 5 up here and the ground across here. And then I have the yellow wire going to pin 0. So if I connect it to the 5 volts, you can see that the number 1 stays there. But if I move it to ground, it changes to 0. So you can use this in either using these buttons over here or you can use the header over here. And we're going to use both of them as we work through all the different configurations. And now we're going to go to the next mode. So we'll go back to the, click on the backdrop here or the back portion of it so we've got the whole page. Go to post initialization. And in this case we're going to take pin number two, we're going to set it to pin mode one, and in pin mode one we can define an object out here to bind the second pin or the second input output device to. So now we just have to add a button. So I have the second pin tied to this button now. So whatever the second pin does, this should be tied to it in some fashion. I'm going to upload this now and I'll show you what I mean. So now you can see I've uploaded this button here and it's tied to button number two. And button number two is this button way over here. And as you can see when I press it, it changes its state. So it's tied to it. And we can also, it's just like the other, um, the other button, we can switch our input over on our pins. I'm going to move this to pin number two. And you can see when I plug it into the ground, it lights up. When I unplug it, it goes off. Now it's generally in a high state, so by plugging it into the power up here, we don't get any change. And now we're going to switch and look at an output. On that board that I'm using, that little push button board that ties into the connection, it has some built in LEDs, and one of them is on pin 6. So I'm going to use pin 6 for all of the outputs the pulse width modulated and the other two. And for the first mode, it's called a push pull output. Now there is a difference between the push pull and the open drain, and I'm going to show you how to wire both of them, but I'm not really going to go into them too much. If you do a simple Google search, you can look up that and it'll show you the different circuits. For the most part you're going to use mode 2 in here because that's the push-pull and you'll see why when I want to show you. And then since it's not mode 1, the second one is, or the third variable here is always set to 0. So now in order to have it be an output though, it has to be something on the next to trigger it. So we're going to add another, we're going to add a button, a dual state button on here. The nice thing about a dual state button is it has two values. It has a 0 and a 1. So when it's pressed, it's 1. When it's not pressed, it's 0. And the way you define the, the inputs is you just PI6. And you can see they, they show up down here. So we can just scroll to it. It's PI0 dot, or PI06 is the one we're going we're gonna to adjust. And there isn't a dot val because it knows it's dot val based upon when we set up that CFPGIO variable, we set it to an output. But we're going to set it equal to BT0. In this case, we do have to put the vowel. And we'll do it on the release. It doesn't matter when we do it, but we will have to let go of the button in order for it to affect. So we'll upload this now. So when we press it, it should both change the LED on the board itself, and then we'll run a wire up to wire up on that little um, breadboard that I have. It's going to be hard to see it. It'll be better when we're up here on the breadboard. But it's just this little LED right over here. Yeah. And you can see that it came on. And that it went off. I'm going to switch the wire now and show you it up on the uh, board itself. I have it running through a resistor to the LED. And you can kind of see the switch down here.
You can see when I press it, it comes on just like the LED on the board and it goes off. So far, this is all pretty simple. Uh, the next one I'm going to get into those, I'm, I'm going to skip up to mode four. I'm going to skip over the pulse width modulation right now and go to the other output. It's one that you're not going to use a lot. It's called an open drain output and it behaves kind of strangely. Once again, I'm not going to get too into it, but I will show you how to how you can configure it and make it work. So for the open drain, it's everything is the same. You just change this pin six to mode four instead. And you can see here mode four is open drain. And then we end in zero. And then we just upload it. Now I've left it wired exactly the same. I'm going to push it. And you'll see nothing happened. And that's because an open drain, the way I think of it, is it drains the voltage when it's on and it doesn't when it's off. So if it's draining the voltage, it has to have voltage. What I have here is I have the 5 volts coming from the board going up through a resistor, down through a second resistor, through the LED to ground. And now when I plug this wire in, you can see that the LED went out because currently it's draining the voltage. Like I said, I don't know if that's the proper terms, but that's how I think of it. And now when I turn it on, the light comes on because it stopped draining the voltage. And when I turn it off, it goes off. I could be wrong on all of this. This is just the way I interpret this. I never use that mode, but after doing some research and looking some things up, that's kind of how I have it, how I have it working. I will go back and do the pulse width modulation. I'm going to continue to use pin 6 for the pulse width modulation. So we just change it to mode 3. But for this, we'll need a slider. Now with the other variables, we had a PI0. You could either read it or write it, and it was either a 0 or a 1. Once we've set the pin, which we did in pin 6 in, this, in that PIGO, in the page initialization, it's configured a little bit different, and then you need, so you'll need to set up how long you want that pulse to be, and it's in percentage. And you can see that you can select the channel that you want right here, and we're on 6. And what you set it to is you could set it to 50. So it would be a 50% duty cycle. In our case, though, we're going to set it to H0.val. But I, I really don't want this on touch release. I want this to be on touch move. So I'm going to copy this or delete it. This way, as we move the slider, we'll see the change on the LED. And that's all there is to it. So we've configured the pin to be a pulse with modulated pin, and then we set the value on that pin based upon some characteristic. In this case, we're going to use a slider. But you can make it statically. You could make a timer count up and down and make it change over time. There's lots of different ways you could do this, but I've just chosen to do it this way for this example. I'll need to take this, I've got this still set up for that open drain. Now it's set up so you can see the LED, both LEDs. And so as I slide it, they should get dimmer and brighter. And you can see that it functions pretty well. So I'm going to hook up the oscilloscope next and put the camera on it so you can see that. I'm not sure if I'll be able to get the slider in with it at the same time or not. The oscilloscope set up. And you can see as I move the slider, you can see the pulse gets smaller and bigger. And that would be the light getting brighter and getting dimmer. So it works pretty much the same as that PCA device I was using earlier, and the same as the Arduino. 
It's just the way you code it's just a little bit different. The other command that you have to be aware of when you're working with pulse width modulation is that window where it goes up and down. The frequency of that happening can change and on the next one you can have it go from 1 hertz all the way up to 6, 65,000. So you can make it go pretty fast. It starts at a default of 1,000 hertz. In order to show you something, I'm going to set the frequency to 1. And when you set the frequency, you set it for all of the devices, or all of the channels. And it's this frequency down here. And we're going to set it to 1. So in other words, it's only going to cycle once every second. So now, when I turn the LED, and I know that I'm going to get that pulse every second, if you think of this timeline as being 1 second, and it's only on for a portion of one second and then off, we should see it. Um, it won't just appear to be dim and brighter. We'll, we will see the LED turn on and off. It should be, since the slider is set at 50, it's on for half a second and off for half a second. If I slide the slider to the left, it should flash, um, it should be on less. And you can see how it is. And if I slide it the other way, it's on longer. So that's kind of interesting. It, it works as a timer in a way. Most of the time you won't use this for that. You'll have your frequency a lot faster. But I wanted to illustrate the fact that you can change the frequency and that this is a way to, to visually see the change. We're going to move on to the servo next. In order to make a servo turn, the servo wants a certain frequency and it wants it to be 50. Well, the servo I'm using wants it to be 50. Different servos would be set differently. You'd have to look that up on your own manufacturer. I'm assuming most of them are 50 because that's what that PCA device comes set to default also. So now when we upload this, we should be able to turn a servo with the slider. It's strange, you can see it flickering, um, you can't in real life, but in the camera it flickers, so that's kind of interesting. I, think I have this set up fairly, fairly well, um, so you can see the servo turn as I move it. Now the servo, in the last one you saw, I had to adjust the slider so that you could see the servo turn, well within the whole range. You'll notice that up here the servo doesn't do anything, it's only at this lower end where it turns. But I'm, I'm happy to report though that the Nexion can drive a servo motor. I have a feeling that if I was going to drive four with all four pulse width modulated channels, I might isolate the servos from the Nexion. Um, I, I know the Nexions are only like 30 bucks, but if you get into the enhanced ones or the, the larger screens, they can get kind of expensive, so that would be up to you to decide. It might not be the safest to leave a servo always hooked on, especially if you put a load then on the servo also. So, But, but it, it is interesting that it does work. And it's fairly easy to set up. I'm going to go back and go over the code again. There's five different modes. The first thing you do is tell it the pin you want, 0 through 7, and then the mode you want. And then in the binding case, you also have to list what you want it bound to. I also want to point out the fact that this B0 could also be the ID. So like B0 here could be 3 instead of the word B0. You can use either one. And you set up each pin individually. So this could be CFGPIO 0 through 7. And each one can operate in whichever way you want it to operate. And then you can adjust the frequency of the pulse width modulated, but that will only affect the, the pins that are set to be pulse width modulated, and it will affect all four. You can't set the frequency individual to each pin. It is all four. And then in the case of the pulse width modulated, you can set it to a value from 0 to 100. 
and that gives you your your width of your pulse. And when you're reading from the an, an input, in this case we have pi we have input zero set to be an input, you can interpret into a value of zero or one and you can read from it. And you can also read from a, a switch and write it to an output, which would be value six we had set up for output on all of our examples. So like I said, it's not super complicated. The thing is you want to make sure you set up your pins on the post initialization of the page. And from what I've read, you want to do it on each page that you're going to be using the pin. So if you had a two or three page um, program in there and you were using a pin across multiple pages, on every page you want to use it, you want to include this. I haven't experimented that far with it at this point, but if I was doing it in a production or an environment I cared about, I would probably follow the recommendations on that. I know I didn't cover this in depthly, but I hope to get more and more into this. So I'm going to use the action to directly control a digital power supply in some upcoming videos. Well, that's about it for this video. If you like what you saw, consider giving me a thumbs up, and also consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks for watching.